and one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another live stream. I have a wonderful guest. And uh, actually, she is one of my favorite people on the face of this planet. <laughs> Aw. <laughs> you are. You know, you, I, I appreciate you. Um, you know, when I was doing that Dog Coach magazine, you were one of the first people that I contacted as an editorial advisor. Mm. And, um, you know, the magazine did not come to fruition for a number of different reasons. But, um, you know, you were you were on board and supported me from the very uh, first day. And I sure do appreciate that. And I've gotten to know you um, through the years as well. And it's just gotten uh, that appreciation has just grown more and more uh, for Robin McFarland, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I remember getting that email, actually. And it was like, whoa, this is. I'm like really honored. It's I didn't know who you were at that time, you know, then started to pay attention. And then when we first and it was, you know what, it's easy to say yes to people when authenticity comes through. And it was like right there in your email. So I'm like, yeah, whatever, whatever I can do. And then when we met face to face it was very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and uh that's what's important about some of these events is just meeting people and seeing, um, you know, that that a lot of times in the dog training world, these intuitive nudges that that um, drive us to this is genuine. And um, and a lot of the people that I've talked to actually fell into this career based on a need that they had for their own personal dog. And then they realized mm -hmm. that there was a big void in the world of, of real uh, help that they could apply, especially to um, cases of aggression and, and, and different things that they weren't seeing the results that they that they wanted to. And so they stepped up and, and filled that void, so to speak. And and it, it's very interesting. But yeah, that, that authenticity is, is extremely important. Mm -hmm. I'm going to share this. Um, let me see here uh, to a couple of groups. And while I do that, do you mind giving people a quick bio of, of uh, what you do, where you're located at and uh, all that stuff? <laughs> I will. I will. Um, gosh. Well, you know, and I've told this story, so there's probably a few people that this might be familiar. So I apologize if it's boring anybody, but um, I fell into the profession, quite honestly. Uh, I wanted to be a veterinarian. That was kind of my goal from the time I was a kid. Started out in college pre-vet, got disenchanted because I live in the Midwest. And it was very apparent very quickly that at that time, and we're talking early 80s, uh, that the influence and the direction was going to be very heavily focused toward the dairy industry and the cattle industry. And that didn't interest me at all. So uh, left the pre-vet, ended up going to the West Coast, worked on my master's for a while in marine science, went broke while I was doing it, took a job <laughs> in a small animal vet clinic. Uh, and it was, you know, it was love within a first couple of weeks of doing that job. I was like, oh, I fit in here. This is what I'm meant to do. And I ended up quitting my master's program, uh, worked in the veterinary industry for nine years. And it it was through that experience that I came to find out what a need there was as far as training was concerned, because you're on the front lines with cases that people feel at their wits end. They don't know what to do for help. And they're asking the, the vet and the healthcare staff, and they don't really have all the answers for people. And so, uh, you know, those years of being in that room, handing tissues to people and holding dogs, say in the last goodbye, mm. really had a very significant impact on me. And uh, I knew I wanted to do something and I started uh, just self-researching, started doing a few little puppy type classes, private lessons, and um, then had a big life altering experience in 1997 and uh, went down a mountain in a side uh, in a U-Haul, went off the side of the, well, we could have chose to go off the side of the mountain or into the mountain. So we chose into the mountain, um, which put me in a wheelchair for a while mm -hmm. and a lot of rehab and, uh, and a lot of time to think and, you know, communicate with the spiritual guides that said, you don't want to do the healthcare part anymore. You want to do the behavioral part. And um, after that, I was on full board. I, I went to uh, National Canine out in Columbus, and that was kind of my starting point for education. Okay. 
and uh, launched the company in 1998, launched That's My Dog in 1998. And uh, we're located, originally started out in Hazel Green, Wisconsin, which is my hometown of 1,253 people. And, uh, and then moved it to Dubuque, Iowa, which is really just across the Mississippi River in 2011. And uh, right now we've got, I've got 13 employees right now <clears throat> and they actually do most of the work and I sit behind a desk. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I travel and I do consulting and I do writing and, and uh, seminars and stuff like that. So, yeah. That's awesome. I mean, when you, when you touch uh, the face of death as you did, you know, it kind of brings uh, what's important uh, right to uh, the center, huh? Oh, big time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Big time. You have a lot of conversations when you're in that moment, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you're very vulnerable, and and so you you were in this U-Haul, and I know the story. Um, and it lost the brakes, right? It That's was correct. It, it was load, it was full loaded and heavy, and and uh, and then you guys, uh, your sister was driving, right? That's correct. Yeah. And and then uh, instead of careening off to the the cliff, you went boom, and then the the, the I saw pictures of it. And even with the as it's sitting still, that the wheels and the hood are up. Right. It was crazy. Yeah, yeah, it was it was, um, you know, I stayed conscious, uh, apparently for the whole thing. There was a brief moment, I think, where we impacted, but I came to right away. Uh, we were on a mountain road um, just not too far. Um, well, I would say maybe an hour west of Lake Tahoe. Um, and we did lose the brakes and I remember my sister's foot going to the floor, you know, mm. trying to, trying to activate the brake pedal and her screaming, you know, we have no brakes and, and what should we do? What should we do? And I just remember saying, go left, go left. Cause I was sitting in the passenger seat looking to the right, which was a big, big drop downhill. So it was a conscious decision to put it, to just bury it into the hill and uh, and I remember coming to and there was there must have been a car that had been behind us. And um, gosh, I just you know, it, it's weird to talk about it because I haven't talked about it in a while. But the way that the U-Haul collapsed, the whole front end collapsed, the windshield was gone. And we were basically shoved into the little tiny compartment that sits behind the seat. So essentially we were compacted into about the width of a 200 berry kennel. Mm. Um, you know, the, the investigators who, who looked at all of the data said we were going about right 85 there. miles an hour. Right over here. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was crazy. They, it was crazy. Um, I talked it's to a guy on the phone and he, I remember he said, he said, I have never seen you, but I saw the, the, the the pictures of the vehicle and and I know the data and he said you must be real thin and I said well my my knee was touching my chest and my calf was touching my knee we were just bent in half basically so the fact that we both survived is pretty miraculous but yeah I was stuck for three hours before they they were able to figure out how to dig me out of it so it was a lot of thinking and negotiating at that time yeah. Well, and, and then after that, you're like, no, I'm going to do what I want to do and what's important to me because I'm kind of on borrowed time. Like I could have gone to heaven. This could have been an exit point for me. And uh, I'm thankful. And by the way, everybody share this, please. <laughs> you know, hit the share button. Robin's awesome. And if you are a dog professional, pay attention to her because she uh, she knows what she's talking about. She's been in the game for quite a while, for 21 years. Uh, that's my dog by itself. But the, previously to that, working with animals uh, in the medical arena and the, the value that she has based on her experience and observations coming from that space is extremely important because I think um, like you said, they don't, they don't know it all, but they're given the task of righting the wrongs of, of these relationships that have been steered off to the ditch. And sometimes I think that their, their hands are tied and, um, they're, they're limited on, on what they, what they can suggest. I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I just know that, uh, I see a lot of dogs on, on Prozac. Mm-hmm. 
and pills. And I think, you know, why is this dog on pills? You know, I, I see him and I'm like, why can't we work through some stuff? Why can't we figure out, um, you know, whole picture approach? Can you speak on that? And, and Yeah, you know, I think you know, having that time in the veterinary industry as a technician served me very well. I can empathize with the role that they're in. I know as a dog trainer, sometimes there's a level of frustration that, well, why would you know, the, the, the veterinarian recommend medication when maybe they don't know the whole picture, but I also understand and empathize. They're in the room with someone that has expressed, I'm at the end of my rope, I don't know what to do, here's the symptoms. And that medical professional has, you know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes with them and mm -hmm. has to move on to the next appointment. So it, I, I get where they want to provide their client and the dog with some sort of relief. And so things, you know, medications and whatnot get prescribed perhaps more often than we would like to see. And that's why I think as trainers and as professionals in this industry, it's really critical that we develop relationships with the veterinary community as best we can um, in our own in our own communities. You know, I'm very, very fortunate having come from the medical aspect, I knew a lot of the veterinarians previously. So when I then moved into training, I had an established relationship. But over the many years that I've done this, I've had to reestablish some relationships or build because new ones came in, new yes. people took over. So I had to work to do that, you know, and, and I'm not hesitant to say, hey, let me take you to dinner. Let me take you to lunch. Can I have an hour of your time just so we can talk? I don't have all the answers, but I know we have to work as a team if we really want to help people out there. That's being authentic. And that's being, you know, honest and and saying, hey, look, we can co accomplish so much more with cooperation than we can with competition. And you know, I don't, I don't know it all. And and I, I don't. I'm assuming that you don't know it all. But maybe together we can form a bigger piece of the puzzle, or, or figure out a bigger piece of this puzzle. And uh, and that's one of the reasons why I, I've I've chosen to do these talks and just live stream them and make them public where people can share them, is. Yeah. Uh, you know, bottom line is that we're here to help dogs and we're here to help people because we see the value of the relationship that that provides. And I mean, just the the experiences that I've gone through uh, losing my father recently in, the, in January. And I also lost my one of my biggest uh, uh, heart dogs, my cedar boy. And the the dog's ability and my little girl I've shown you earlier, my little heart dog. <laughs> there <Right> she is. <laughs> yeah. She's always behind me. Just if, if I'm standing here on one of these live streams, just know that she's Aww. right behind me. And, uh, you know, and I get it. I get how these dogs are, are so, they put our mind in just a, such a wonderful place. They pull us out of some of the deepest holes that, that uh, life can put us in. And mm -hmm. um, those relationships are very important. And by coming together, uh, with a handout approach and and how can we figure this out because we 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 need to these dogs are paying with this with their the mistakes that we make with their lives they are they they absolutely are and i think we sometimes we uh, in the dog profession you know we see it from the dogs perspective and we think about the dogs first because we're just so in tune to that and and so much of that is obvious to us but I've never been able to forget the impact it had on the human element because of that time in the vet clinic. And that's carried with me. If, if it's just such an enormity to lose a dog and it's one thing for you and I to lose our heart dogs due to age and yeah. due to, you know, we're making a decision based on their best interest because of they've reached their lifespan and we don't want them to be in pain anymore. But to make those kind of decisions when you've only had a dog two years or four years and you're making it because you simply feel you have no help or no options available to you and you don't know what else to do. It's just brutal. And, and it's brutal on the individual. But yeah, then you put that in a whole family dynamic. That's just not stuff I think. I think that's stuff that children, people, human beings, we're left with that as little scars that impact. You know, that's on your skin forever when you have to make those kind of decisions for those kind of reasons. And, and I try not to ever forget that that's a responsibility that I carry by being part of this industry is helping those people. 
And I think we forget about that as dog uh, people that are passionate about dogs. And I often say, you know, I'm, an, I'm like an attorney for the dog. We represent the animal <laughs> and, uh, you know, what the best interest for this animal. But, you know, that whole picture approach to and, and, and about their lives and how busy they are, because just like they have these kids and and uh, the crazy life, you know, I'm like, did you do the, the training that was needed um, for, for this week? And they're like, oh, man, we have soccer games. We had this. We had that. And I'm just like, I get it. You know, it's 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 a crazy dynamic. It's a quagmire sometimes. And then especially with some powerful breeds um, that that uh, people are I call them looking at breeds because I just think that they're looking at dog. They don't think that this dog has like a purpose. I and, like that. Uh, well, and that's it. I mean, we have to consider the dog's purpose and the dog's purpose has changed uh, pretty dramatically over the last hundred years. And yeah. uh, some of the stuff that we once needed these dogs for, in fact, security, just walking down that street um, and having a, a big dog in there. But also I look at some of the videos of, of before and I'm like, what happened? Where, where, where did the, the switch happen? Because I see these dogs that are amazing on these videos from like the 1930s and and um, I'm like, where did we lose this old knowledge? And and that's mm -hmm. where I try to seek out, um, like uh, even like KMODT, you know, getting certified in that. And every everywhere I can uh, get certified, even uh, with the the Karen Priors and the Don't Shoot the Dog and the yep. you know the pearls everywhere. Yeah. And um, what I think is valuable is the tools that are available to us. And you've become an advocate using tools as well. Um, in, in my opinion, the tools kind of allow for a little bit of leeway on timing and distance uh, addressing uh, certain behaviors. And what I'm talking about is uh, e-collars, yep. um, different long lines and, and uh, collars and stuff like that. But what when I say tool, that's exactly what it is. It's a tool and the understanding yeah. needs to be the end goal. Yeah. Um, how did you stumble on these tools and, and you've become kind of an expert at using these, especially with the e-collars? Yeah, you know, in my early education about e-collars, I was very much, and, and I, I don't think that everybody may know my story that when I did get started and I was back there in that veterinary time frame. I think you could call me pretty positive only base because it was the only information that I had at the time. And yeah. so I was doing all of my work based on, you know, food reward and, and very little else. Um, and, and a lot of management and, and I'm a big advocate of that very much a big advocate of that, but I also found some shortcomings and we, we came up against some walls and that's of course when I started to study more and I, I would, venture to guess if I'm accurate in my recollections that a pinch collar was probably the first tool that I added um, to start to balance some things out. And I mentioned I went to National Canine. They at that time taught a lot about slip collars. They also used pinch, but they did a lot with slip collars. Um, so then I learned about that tool. Then I started getting into e-collars. But my my thought process was very much like everybody else. This is a tool of last resort. You know, you I thought there was the hierarchy and you go up the tool hierarchy before you ever got to the mysterious and scary shock call. Yeah, that was the end. <laughs> oh, like like that is like the la like just like you hear you, you talk about these people coming in at their the end of their their rope, like that's the end, like that's same same with me. You know, we start out we start out positive only. Um and then but uh you know, and, and James says flexibility of modalities means we can help more dogs. James is a good guy. He, he, he's, he's a heck of a trainer. He, we and I, we chat from time to time and he sends me some videos. The, that guy's got it going on over there. Yeah, a little lab, a little lab yeah. he's, he's working yeah. with. Makes me want to get a lab. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but absolutely. And where do you use it now? I mean, so how did that, how did that evolve for you? Because so, so when I, when it, because it was initially, it was that mentality of mine. And then as I learned more, I started to integrate it with my clients who we, we were basically bumping into the issue of we can't get off leash reliability. Of course, I'm in the Midwest. A lot of people have a lot of property, a lot of opportunity to, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people that didn't necessarily need to have their dog on a leash out here. Um, 
so getting reliability off leash for some of the dogs, particularly I had several clients at that time with Nordic breeds. So we were doing well with the, with the basics, but I said, yeah, I think I can give you a recall if you're willing to do this. And I, I always took the dog initially for a week or two in board and train because I was holding, honing my own skills at that time. So I said, before I can do the, you know, you got to think in two different ways when you're trying to teach a human how to teach their dog. So I said, let me teach the dog first and then I'll teach you how to do it. So that's how I honed my skill set initially. But oh, wow. the more I got into it and the more efficient I got at actually training the human how to do it, the faster I started to realize that this was not a tool that was going to be last resort. This was a tool I was going to give to my clients as an option up front and say, I can do this or I can do this. It really just is gonna depend on what your goals are for your dog, and that'll that'll give us a direction. And uh, it didn't take long. Um, by 2002, I was pretty much saying, you know, this is my preference. I would encourage this if you're comfortable with it, because I think you're gonna be happy with the outcome. And, and, and when I was doing that, it was because, and I, I like everybody to remember that my primary audience was a pet dog. And what I knew about the pet dog industry is that people did need to get to their, reasonably to their goals in a fairly quick amount of time. If I was gonna mess around and say, well, we gotta do this for six weeks first, and then you're gonna put in four more weeks doing this, I wasn't gonna get the buy-in. Yeah. You know, and it was as simple as that. So if I could say to somebody, you know what, let's put in a couple lessons. And after a couple lessons, your dog's going to be able to come when called with the collar on. I wasn't promising anything unreasonable. You're going to have an off leash, off leash recall with the collar on. You're going to stop the jumping up. You're going to have a, a stationary command like a place command. And I can give you that in a very short amount of time. And if you want to do a lot more, absolutely game on we can do tons more but at the very least i can give you a dog you can live with successfully for the rest of your life and that was my goal because i didn't want them ended up back at the shelter or in that veterinarian's office because they had had so many problems you know yeah absolutely you're just so, kind of looking for the hot hot buttons so like like you can kind of put out these fires to allow that relationship to maintain the course of um you know that that dog's life, or or until that dog calms down a little bit, or until that people kind of um, get a better relationship with them. And and basically, this is uh, we belong to a push button society. I have this this but this little black box that I carry around in my phone that mm -hmm. I'm, I'm addicted to. I'm not <laughs> I'm not gonna <laughs> uh, sugarcoat it, <laughs> but um, you know it's it's gives us access. It changes the way that we think, but it also uh, it shows it, it gives us like this instant gratification type of thing. Um, yeah. And we're looking for quick, effective, efficient uh, results. And it doesn't always work that way with behavior, but there's tools that we can use to help us communicate in a way that the dog is going to get it. And I mm -hmm. love what you say about the two different ways. I mean, I know it was at the beginning, but, you know, we're, we're teaching an animal and we're teaching a person. And the number one thing that mistakes that people make is by anthropomorphizing the animal and putting the human characteristics on this animal. And um, they, they do, we learn differently. Absolutely, we learn differently. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, that's one of the, that's probably one of the secrets about this profession. Anybody that's, that's gonna be watching our little interview today, if they're thinking about going into the training industry, it's fantastic to put energy you need to put energy into learning how to train a dog, mm. but that's only 50% of the equation. And the, and the dog will never write you a check ever. So it's not going to put food on your table. If you don't learn, how are you going to train the human species? This career, either you won't last, you'll get burned out, or you won't have a high level of success. You know, I, and I'm quite honestly, and I've said this many times publicly, I, I truly believe I'm a mediocre dog trainer but I'm a pretty exceptional people trainer. And that is the difference in why my career has done well for me is because I can make sense of it for the average person. 
You know, I've always asked the people that come on to these talks of me, I say, what do you tell people that that's, uh, say I'm only in dog training because I don't like people <laughs> and you've just addressed it. <laughs> good you know, luck. Yeah, good luck. I mean, a lot of people are like, well, maybe maybe you could be a camel tech, you know, <laughs> or something. That <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but, but that's crucial. I mean, these dogs don't write the checks and that connection is what's needed. And, uh, and and that communication, you're opening up the lines of communication so that they may open up the lines of communication and you're leaving, you're not always gonna be there either. Yeah. And that's and the, this needs to translate. Yep. And, um, and that's what I do like about these uh, tools is that it makes the translation process and the timing aspect much easier. Yeah. Um, for the for the people to grasp, and um, so we got Stella just says hello. Let me see down here. Um, Don says hello. Tosh says uh, hello. Um, everybody, if you have any questions for Robin, or uh, type down where in the world you are watching us from. Uh, people from all over the world. It's so cool this technology um, that's available to us. So, um, you know, have you do you still maintain a relationship at all with National Canine? Um, I see those folks at the ICP conference, you know, I see Bob out there. I had spent a little while since I talked to Scott, Scott and I used to stay in touch a little bit more. Um, my class members, I don't know that I've heard from them, but you know, the whole national canine group, as far as long-term, there's a lot of graduates out there. And so, you know, we see each other, like I said, at conference and there's so many of them that are members of IACP. So we do stay in touch through through that uh, avenue. But, um, you know, something I wanted to comment on, Bill, when we were talking about the e-collar and you said, you know, that aspect of instant gratification. And, and I had mentioned to you that the big reason that I pursued it as heavily as I did is because I was able to give people that quick response, um, quickly that meet hope. their goals, that you know? Hope. You know, something that hope. That they, yes, exactly. They it. they saw they saw a change rather quickly. And in my years of doing this, year, years ago when I was writing my blog, the truth about shot callers, I would be criticized quite harshly about you know it's the lazy person's way and things like that. But what I discovered very quickly, my experience with the e collar work is once people got that instant gratification. They were hooked into training their dog. Collar or no collar, they got hooked into training their dog because they felt like they could do it. They didn't get discouraged with the process. And so here we are now at this point in 2019. Yes, we have a variety of programs, tra training programs for our clients. But people were saying very early on, what more can I do? What more can I do? So we've got three levels of trick classes. We got three levels of canine parkour. We got scent class. We got indoor games. We got a whistle clinic. We have so many options for people to participate here in our little town because they just want to do more training with their dog. And that like just strengthen. Once that started to happen, it strengthened my belief in what I was doing and that I was on the right course because I wasn't shortchanging anybody on the ability to re to build a relationship with their dog. And that was crucial. And it pushed me forward to keep going and spread the message of what we were doing with the e-collar. I remember talking to you back in geez, 2011 or 2010. And uh, you said to me something that I will always remember. I was like, how do you how do you deal with people, you know, vitriol attacks or anything like that? And you said, well, Bill, I, you know, people are smart. I believe deep down people are smart. And when they start to see how we use these tools and see that the last thing I want to ever do is hurt a dog. And then they see the, the, the um, you know, the effect that it's having, um, th that it kind of carries carries them along. And, and they realize that um, maybe they don't know what they don't know. And, mm -hmm. uh, and since then... I mean, you, you, I'm a different dog trainer, um, you know, and as we grow as dog trainers um, and the tools grow with us and the techniques and, um, you know, the, the, the things that we can do with it and look at what you're doing. I mean, look at how many things that you're branching out, providing fulfillment for dogs and people mm -hmm. and not only that, but the relationship and the communication aspect is getting to be like an eight lane highway. <laughs> Hopefully, in theory. 
It is. It is. Uh, you know, if I was, that's the one, there's like the upside and the downside to living in a small community. Um, if I was doing something that was harming the relationship that people have with their dogs, I live in a town of 50,000. I mean, it would travel real fast and I wouldn't have been here for 20 plus years. You know, it just wouldn't be because it's too small of a community. And, and the opposite has happened. You know, now we have clients from a 200 mile radius and beyond. I mean, you get the occasional people that ship their dogs into us, but no. And, you know, I have a client, uh, we're just training. She's been with me since she won. We just trained her six dogs. She's one of those people that always has two or three at a time. She's on number six, you know, and, and they start to inquire. We just start, we're going to pick up our dog next week. When can we get started? So we're on the right path. You know, the answer to me is you're on the right path because my clients have verified that to me. Yeah, that's social proof. Yeah. You know, and so we got some people here. We got William George Webb from the UK saying hello. Mc Robin McFarlane, it is very much a people person, or, or excuse me, Robin McFarlane is very much a people business, and knowing how to transfer skill to the human is so important, as you said. Uh, James there, love you, James. James and I were going to be doing an event in uh, L.A. Uh, February next year. He's in Australia. Good day, down under. It's starting to be winter down there. Yeah. We got Salisbury, Maryland in the house. Texas, just outside Chicago. We got a Canuck here. And we have, um, oh, I guess he's tagging somebody there. Sam, look at Sam's uh, profile picture, ladies and gentlemen. I he know. is absolutely beautiful. Dude, you need to, you need to change that thing, man. It's making, me, it's making me question myself over here. <laughs> During your experience as a trainer, I mean, and seeing as uh, you know, social media and stuff. So, what what are you up to? I know that you have uh, primarily worked with a dog tra, um, and is that still the case? Are you? Uh, tell me, tell me what's up with the e collar world. And what's I your have been on dog tra's pro staff for quite a while. Um, gosh, 2000, 2004, maybe. Um, I, I write for them. Um, I started writing for them. I think I just submitted the 27th blog entry for them. Um, so I have been with them for quite some time. Um, good people. Uh, they've been, you know, they've become friends, members of the pro staff, Pat Nolan. Awesome. Pete Fisher. Um, you know, people I respect very much in the training world, people that that have taught me things. Um, so that's been just absolutely wonderful. Um, you know, so yes, I've been an advocate for them for a long time. There's other good callers on the market too. You know, I'm not a person that's going to trash talk. Uh, yeah, it, you know, that's just not my thing. Um, so, and I'm certainly competent at using pretty much anybody's equipment with the expectation that it's quality equipment there's yes. you know somebody's buying the the $50 collar off of um you know eBay or whatever or Amazon or whatever that's not going to be a decent piece of equipment but there are quite a few good manufacturers out there you know I've worked with several of them in the past um in I've worked, radio systems has had me down a few times we've done some work together doing some writing um, and educational materials. Um, Garmin had me down to visit a while back. I've worked with the group from PET who's trying to um, carry the same banner that ECMA does over in the UK to, to be the proponent for you know quality e-collar use and control. Nice. Um, so all those folks, I consider all of them colleagues. I think we all have the same, same common goal to help the consumers understand how to use this properly to keep the quality of the pieces of equipment high and, and I that's a very common goal that dog tra shares with with the other manufacturers as well why do you think that it's important to buy quality <sighs> because the dog's gonna pay the price if you don't you know um, we need reliability we need something we need that's not going to you know build trust trust is paramount Absolutely. And then you, you, knock know? It down. you know, it takes sometimes it's like reputation, you know, it can take so long to build and a second to destroy. It does. It is, you know, the dog is going to suffer. Ultimately, that's the number one reason to buy quality is the dog is going to potentially suffer from having a, a 
poor quality piece of equipment. Um, and secondly, it harms the industry as a whole to have poor quality pieces of equipment out there. And that's frustrating to me because you get a, a poor quality piece of equipment and, and people are going to apply the brush stroke, the broad brush stroke that, well, that's what e-collars are like. And that is not true. And so that's frustrating and something we have to continue to to um, make people aware of that there's a difference. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, some of these uh legislations around the world that we see that are banning some of these tools um you know i think that that's where we need to step up as professionals and be like no 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 this is very valuable i've seen these tools literally save dogs lives is it the same for you absolutely absolutely and i've got plenty of testimonials that say that you know if they hadn't if they hadn't found this and, and just like everybody else i know there's probably a lot of e-collar advocates out there and yourself included bill we have all gotten those dogs and those clients that have come to us after they've been through x number of trainers and god bless the trainers they went to first because a lot of them laid a beautiful foundation for me to just say well just add in this little bit and you're pretty good to go. And it makes me look like a rock star and I didn't even have to work that hard. But the client is incredibly thankful because they finally are getting what they want. I got your DVD around here somewhere. What oh gosh, the, you got the, the very, early ones. The very early one. You know, yeah. and the thing is that you taught me was the, the, the frequency, to up my frequency with this bad boy. You know, just, but I think I when I first started with that, watching it, it was, um, uh, I was still at the end of the line use type of mentality, you mm. know, instead of this is just a like handing this dog a, a communication tool and, uh, you know, and just letting the dog figure it out. And I locked in that the place command too. I do that. I did that with the, um, the Nick, Nick, Nick back to the place. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, lock. I mean, it was amazing. I mean, and that's that's it. Is is results? People want to see results. They're paying you for results. Or a lot of times, like you said, they've been uh, to a number of different options. They're they're trying all that they can, and um, and and we owe it to them. Yeah, we do. We yeah. do. I mean, we and and the dog will pay for it if 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 we don't. I mean, and that's it. Hold on, James Penrith. Does a marvelous job advocating for the e collar. He sent a link. So William just sent a link before. Okay. Oh, Sam Tavar looks so good. <laughs> Calm down, boys. That's what Sam says. And then we have Laura from Telford, PA. <laughs> so, you know, and then you just did something for um, the, the, um, gun dog did you write oh a big, yeah big thing My or what what what's going on with them uh yeah, that has been um a delightful relationship actually my friends at gun dog supply i cannot say enough good things about that company overall and the folks that that are in charge down there um steve snell who owns the company and his brother rob uh well they 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 were selling um my first dvd um when that came out in the second one. And, uh, and then of course, I, I think I mentioned when I was blogging the truth about shock collars for about two years, 18 months, two years, we were, we we're in the top 10 on Google for that. And I was just out there passionately, you know, I, I have a bit of an opinion from time to time, Bill. So <laughs> that was my place to express my opinion. It was just strictly my blog. It was entirely on my dime that I was doing that whole thing. And uh, I was putting out a lot of pieces of information that were getting noticed. And, and Steve and Rob basically came to visit at one point and said, uh, you know, why are you doing this? We can't quite understand 100% why you're doing this. I said, because it's important to me and I just got something to say. And, and essentially the relationship started because they said, well, you know, we like your approach to it. And we'd like to be able to help our clients understand your message and put that out there. And so they gave me a platform that uh, I'm just so, so grateful for. And uh, we have, you know, they've put up a ton of videos and blogs that I've written and they're giving it away all for free on their website. So there's just a ton of helpful information. Well, then we got, you know, we started getting good feedback. And so we did a little, um, oh, I think it's maybe a 45 minute DVD that they gave out free with all the, the 
with all their collar purchases, again, because they also wanted to be advocates for it takes education. Yes. How do we teach people how to use this? And it got such a nice reception that we decided to do something more comprehensive. And this was such a fun project. So we decided what can we do that's more comprehensive? And, um, and most importantly, you know, because the word I'm always stuck on is what can we do to be authentic? Because there's no way I'm going to do a comprehensive piece with a pre-trained dog. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And Steve and Rob were 100% on board with that. So I personally adopted three dogs from shelters um, of varying personalities. You know, the kind of shyer reserve dog, the uh, owner relinquished pain in the butt dog, <laughs> who was a healer mix, uh, <laughs> and the and the kind of fearful but but high drive uh, dog. Okay. So we had these three distinct personalities, and I I went down. I stayed with my friends in in uh, Mississippi at. Um, uh, Burnt Oak Lodge. They let me stay there. And we filmed every single day for three weeks and followed the progress of these three dogs and put them through what I would consider my typical pet dog program. And we did it every day, documented all of these, um, all of these video sessions. And so people got to see from beginning to end, here's how you do it. No secrets, no nothing, different personalities. Here's adjustments you make. And they put that together into a five CD set that we just released in January. And then, and we're getting really nice feedback from it. Fantastic. So. I put a link up to the gun uh, supply, uh, do gundogsupply.com. Um, and then I just put all of Robin's uh, products or what they recommend for Robin uh, McFarland in. in uh, in that link as well so just click on that navigate around that site and um you know we got the three dvds as well the um hey, let me go back to the first page here the one that i had was hold on it's uploading what was the first dvd oh right here probably just right just right, just just right. right. yeah just right too and uh, and then we have uh, teaching the place command who's the who's the one on the teaching the place command cover Who's that girl? Is that a? Uh... Is that me? No, no, no. It's a dog, a, a tan dog, white chest. Is it uh, Diva? I don't know who's I on. You know. I think it's Diva. I'm it's probably sure. Diva. I, I can't tell you for certain. I never look at my work once it's completed. I can't do it. Can't <laughs> stomach it. it. Never look at it again. I don't ever. Well, I do sometimes listen to it, but yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And yeah. here's the uh, five. Uh, DVD set. I'm going to put up a link with what you were just talking about on its own uh, link here. DVD set. And then w tell me about your seminars. If people want to come, I think that is very valuable uh, to get these DVDs and, and learn. But if you want to take your understanding a bit further, and that's why uh, these conferences are so valuable, it's just, it, 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 there's a lot. Uh, that goes into networking with people, looking at them in the eyes and shaking their hands, um, having them meet your dog and, and watch you work and, and coach. And that's why I, I went with dog coach is because I feel like a lot of times I'm coaching people to get yeah. the dog that they want. Um, and so it, tell me about your seminars and, um, and how people, uh, professionals can learn from you. Well, and, and uh, that has actually shifted ever so slightly recently. Um, I started training professionals quite a long time ago. I think it was 2003, 2004. Um, and I ran for many years a, a program called the TMD. That's my dog, e Academy. And uh, it started out actually as a three-week course time constraints became difficult for people, especially when we kind of all went through 2008. And, uh, and we shifted it to a 10 day course at that time to make it easier. And um, I always took small classes, you know, four or five, six people at a time. But I don't know if it's because uh, I'm just getting older, and it's challenging for me. But I found that I was getting a little disenchanted on my end because I didn't feel like I could help each individual the best that I wanted to. Um, so with that, I took a sabbatical, uh, took last year off from training trainers. And now this year I've come back with just a private shadowing program. Okay. Um, people come out individually. 
And we assess, well, there's a, an assessment initially for what their goals are and stuff and what they want to do. So they come out individually so that I can really tailor and, and meet that person's needs. Um, so I'm finding right now that I'm super happy with that. Um, and, and that will probably continue for a while. Um, my um, workshops, more often than not, are what I would consider tailored to a pet owner, but I have a ton of trainers that come to them. Um, what I do in my workshops are, again, I basically try to take people through that basic skill set of how you condition the dog to the e-collar, how you develop some comprehension with the dog, how you teach basic skills of movement toward, movement away, and stationary behavior. So that's what we do in a workshop. Um, pet dog owners obviously learn an enormous amount, but I think dog trainers certainly learn things and and they definitely learn how I approach training humans, which I think is a big piece of why a lot of trainers come and watch what I'm doing at those seminars. So um, I want to write. Well, I know we keep talking about <laughs> it. And it's one day. We will. We will. But Sorry, so, interrupt you. No, it's all good. It's all good. So there'll be, um, I'm negotiating a couple of them right now. We don't have anything listed. Um, I just moved to a new house. So my husband and I have spent the last few months, we're doing all these renovations and stuff to our place. So I, again, put seminars, I put travel a little bit on hold. Um, so, but I'm negotiating some, some uh, stuff for in the fall and next spring. So I'll be back out there hitting the road again with that. So yeah, yeah that's, that's what I'm doing. That's awesome. And I put up a link to your site too. That's my dog, uh, coach, nice, like it, suggests the owner is gonna do the training. That's what, exactly what I said. And I tell people, every good team needs a coach. Yeah. And that's what I tell them, you know, I'm the coach. And I tell them, look, I'm not, and not like that, but I'm not the, the end all be all. This, you know, this right here, this little little lady right here is <laughs> is gonna tell you, you know, if I'm full of it, you know, and that's it. It's like let your dog show you, and that's what's good about these uh, these tools is um, is is that it it, it kind of it, I like it because it gives a button. Honestly, you know, I think that people are looking for that button to push. I, I think that it just puts it in a manageable way because even when I'm teaching like leash skills and stuff like that, people get so frustrated, like trying to get it right. Right. They do. They do. Yeah. And I, I think that I do think that a lot of our society is, you know, is very oriented toward that button and it comes, it comes a lot more intuitively. Once you show them kind of the basics, it comes intuitively to a lot of people. Um, so I do think that they grasp it rather quickly. But I also think that as trainers, once they grasp those concepts and that they're showing proficiency in them, then a good coach starts to challenge as well. You know, we, we want to support and we want to bring them to a certain level. And as soon as we see they get to that level, then it's time to go to the next level. You know, one of my mottos that I've, I've said for a long time is you go as fast as you can, but as slow as you need to. And you do that with the dogs and you do that with the humans. And when the humans show proficiency, then let's take them to the next level. You know, people that show up to our group classes, they never know what they're walking into. It's very possible to say, well, guess what, everybody today, your collar is dead. So we're going to be training without our collars today. Um, you know, oh, my gosh, this, you know, we just show them all kinds of different things. Um, because we want to develop proficiency, teaching them how do you work with your dog regardless, hmm. regardless of tool, regardless of distraction, regardless of situation? Can you learn to problem solve and navigate the world you want to live in with your dog? And so it's our job as good coaches to always challenge them to get to that next level. Yep. And know what level that they're, they're at as well and where they want to be, too. You know, a lot of times it's like. I see so much potential in this dog and they just want a cool dog, you know, hang out with them, you know, and, and it's, yeah. it's important to listen to them and, and, you know, to, to meet their needs as well. Um, let me see here we have, and then I want to know, why do you call it? That's my dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're going to embarrass me. You're going to, this is yes. going to, this is going to give people just a smidge of insight to the real Rob McFarlane, who isn't always as all put together as she pretends to be. True story. Oh, True story. Um, 
before I had a company and I was just kind of training, um, you know, I training, like I said, when I was working at the vet clinic and stuff and just doing it as an individual and not as a business, I have a really bad memory, really bad. So I would forget the dog's name. I would forget the human's name. If it was a long haired dog, I might forget the dog's gender. And so it was always my cover instead of saying, oh, you know, that's a good boy. That's a good girl. Oh, oh there dog. you go. I go, oh, that's my dog. <laughs> I had no clue. I'm so glad that's I my asked. Dog. <laughs> and my ex-husband, we're good friends yet. He's a graphic designer. And uh, when I was coming up with the the name for a company, I was like, I don't know what to call it. You know, what do I call it? And he goes, you, you know, you say this all the time. You say it all the time. That's my dog. And I was like, that's it. It just stuck. You know, it was authentic. That was the truth. So that's how we got it. That's my dog. That's my company name. <laughs> <laughs> So um, is that the best way people to, to get you is to uh, reach you out? At, that's my dog. Um, um, they absolutely can. That'll make it to me. Um, that's my dog. I have a I have a, a office manager and a general manager at That's My Dog right now. So there are kind of a few steps to go through. Um, but they can also get me through my personal website, uh, robinmacfarlane.com. Um, they can always hit the contact there to, to kind of get a little bit faster route directly to me if that's what they're looking for. Um, because Robin right Mac now that's Farlane. still did I just spell me. It right? Can you spell yeah. it? Yeah, you did. Yeah. You have to just remember the Mac. And I'm going to put this in a link in the um, comments too. Anything else you want to say or, or touch on? This has been awesome. I can't wait. Are you going to go to ICP this year? I am. I am. My son lives out in Colorado, so I'm super stoked to spend some time with him and to see everybody and, of course, to see you. And it'll be so fun. Speak on that. Do you, what do you recommend about people joining or, or going to these events? Um, uh, canine professionals, I'm going to put this up here. Weren't you a member or weren't you on the board or something? I, yeah, I met, uh, I met Martin and Pat and Cap Haggerty and Mary Mazzari and all those, and Cindy Duan and all those original folks in 1999, I met them. The, the and, year uh, after you started. Yes. Yes. Because I was looking for support because again, I'm in Dubuque, Iowa is very isolated. We didn't have, we don't have any dog clubs or anything else. Uh, so I was on an email uh, chat group, um, or forum, however that worked years ago. And, um, chat there room. was a woman on there. Yeah. 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 And there was a woman named Pam green who has since passed away. She was a very early, very inspirational mentor of mine. And she introduced me to a group, um, called the pro trainers. And, um, she was real, she was wonderful. She held my hand through a lot of early learning for me. George Cockrell, another one, um, George, wonderful guy. Yeah. Love you, George. Big daddy. Um, I want big daddy. George and, and, uh, Cindy Duan. Absolutely. I've, I've been in touch with Mary Mazzari. Um, and I would love, um, for all three of them to join me on one of these sessions as well. So I'm, I'm coming for you if you're watching this. <laughs> so much brilliance. Tony Anchetta. Tony was a Tony. Yeah, I want Tony on this too. He's, I got a he's good very... Tony story. I should tell you sometime, okay. but we'll do that privately. Cause okay. Dang it. <laughs> What a good Tony story. Tony has a bad uh, connection at his property. Uh, I tried to, we tried to do a live stream and like he had to call somebody to get like a, a lot of bandwidth and all, it was a, a pain. Uh, but I'm working on it folks because he is uh, a luminary and old school knowledge through and through. I talked to that, I've talked to that guy for hours on end, I've taken his course. Uh, yep. After I was certified in it, I would take it again and again because there's just so much understanding. Yes. Um, and that's that's KMODT, folks. That a lot of people, especially as Keeler method of dog training is what it stands for. It spells like Kohler. Um, here, let me get just grab one of my many KMODT books. Um, if I can find it, there's a tracking dog one. But um, this is one of the most gentle and uh, and fair 
methods I've I've learned, and that's where I I, I can't uh, stress enough that if you're a professional, um, especially the long line stuff and the, yep. the repetition, and you know, it's really really puts fills in gaps that I have used and gone back to even with champion dogs um, to to help their performance. Repetition is a key word you just said there, Bill. That's something that sometimes is lost and uh, regardless of what tool you're using err on the side of repetition give the dog there's a chance no to learn there's no substitution there's no way around there's no way under there's no way over this folks repetition is the mother of learning and we're going to show you the best way to do it but you need to do the work and that's why we charge money when we do it because it is work. And once I explain to people the process that it goes through, they're like, oh, wow, I'm like paying you minimum wage. I'm like, I know, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's like because we spend so much time, it's a 24 7 gig here, you yep. know? And, um, and that's important. Like if you uh, are, are somebody that is uh, on the fence about paying somebody to, to train their dog, if their quality, you know, buck up because you're, yeah. you're going to be happy with the results. But that, that quality is, is, um, is a big factor. You know, we're putting a lot of trust and people go through uh, many different trainers sometimes. And sometimes they just, like you said, they end up in a, a vet's office thinking that, they're going to have to take a, a date with the needle. Yeah. And there's no uh, taking that back. Yeah. And um, so we, 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 we owe it to our, our dogs, our, our friends here, um, to do what's right for them. And, and I thank you for stepping up and, and feeling, not only recognizing the void uh, through the medical um, lens of, of something that's, that's needing to be fixed here, but stepping up and taking action uh, for the last 21 years, and uh, you know, running, running, running your your shop. Now we're getting older and slowing down, and and now you can look back. Just at, shifting a little. Just yeah, shifting a just little. Shifted, down shifting there. <laughs> so thank you, Robin. If you hold on, um, hold on. KMODT was the first book I ever bought. Yep. But even buying the books does not do it justice. In fact, I think the way and the style that it was written back during the mm -hmm. time that it was written, what do you think about that? Can you, I mean, before we go, I wanted to, because I, I, I read the book and I'm like, yeah, that sounds pretty harsh, you know, or, or something, you know, <laughs> you know, the little sayings. But, you know, we live in a different time now. We and do. And, and, you know, when I first read it, uh, again, Pam Green, who I had referred to, was the person that recommended it to me, <clears throat> and she was a, KM, a Keeler Method trainer. And so I read it, <clears throat> I didn't really know anything about it at the time, and then I discussed a bit with her afterwards, and I said my take on it was that the author, because I obviously didn't know him either, the author was at some point in his life where he was probably subjected to criticism. and. I thought that that was, he was writing from that standpoint, like, you know, there was, there was that edginess to it because he probably had been subjected to criticism. And I totally a hundred percent get that because again, being the outspoken advocate that I've been for the collar world. And when I was doing the truth about shock collars for quite a while, man, you get brutalized and you, you can only take it and be polite for so long. And at some point you kind of start to shoot a few daggers back. Yes. So I, that I could understand that his, the words he chose and, and the tone of that book was written from that standpoint. But as you said, the beauty of it is it was so systematic, so methodical, so many repetitions. It's so incredibly fair to the dog once you get rid of that emotional tone that it was written in and you see it and do it and experience it, you know, David Dykeman redid the Keeler method and put that on video. And it was very interesting when you watch that visually, as opposed to reading the book, you're like, Oh, it's a totally different take on it. hundred percent different take on it. And it's all Keeler. Mind blowing, mind, mind blowing, yeah. and, and you can see the fairness. Yep. Even as a professional, you're like, oh my gosh. Yep. It makes 
total sense. And then you look at that dog, you know, my dog, my little Ash, my little girl right here is Keeler trained, you know, yeah. I'm using the methods that I, that, that are there. Yeah. And, um, you know, during week like eight, he put a freaking um, a thread between the, the leash and the collar, you yeah. know, and all these commands have to be done with a, with a thread, you know, and, and tell me that's not gentle, you know, yeah. and, and you know, I love it. So Tony and Chetta, we're going to get him on. KMODT is a professional. Check it out. He Tony offers online classes as well. But just talking to him, you're going to know that this guy knows what he's talking about. And yeah. he's produced champion dogs himself. Yeah. So all those folks, all the, our conversation about all those folks started with the whole um, IACP. So for, yeah, for people out there that are, that are pros or just getting into it, you need to connect, you need to network and um, you know, you need to find mentors and you need to find some of those voices, uh, the seasoned voices that like Tony's and get some of those seasoned voices and sit back and just listen for a while because man, without those people, in my in my history, I would be nothing. I would yep. be nothing. They they make you who you are. I couldn't agree yeah. more. I couldn't agree more. And also, you know, further your your learning. And that's what's good about these events. You know, uh, is that we we come in and and they have speakers that you might not think. And I like that. You know, that they might not have because yeah. it's going to. We need to come together and we need to bridge the sport dog with the pet dog world, too. I think that we both have stuff to learn from each other and uh, and that we can we can have harmony together. And I've, I've preached that. And that's another reason why I interview a lot of sport dog people on this uh, page as well. And, 100 percent uh, agree. Yeah, there's nothing tra studying with sport dog trainers, hunting dog trainers. But I, those 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 aspects will accelerate your understanding and your career dramatically. So let me see, can you give an example of the, that method compared to other for a behavior? Oh, I mean, just, just the, um, I, what I like about that method is that we start broad and then there's a readiness test along every step of the process. And so the dog, there's like a feedback with the dog. And not only that, but with that method, there's just like what Robin was saying about the two different ways to teach, that's happening simultaneously because the person is learning and then the dog is learning as well. And I tell people, you know, this is for the dog. You know, that's why I use a chain or something on the back because that click, click, click is an audible indicator on the dog, back of the dog's head. So that's for the dog, the, the heavier leash, when you drop to make a corrective turn, that little bump that that dog experiences from that drop before you turn is that indicator. The hands together, either before and out or when we're stopping and sitting to do a Joe sit command. That's for the dog. So the dog can be, oh, whoops, you know, until they start to really, really get it. That's called being fair to this animal. I think one of the things that I, I really liked when I first started looking at, at Keeler method is that the, the, the long line work in the beginning is huge, is pivotal. It's yeah. pivotal. It, it's the, it's the make break piece of the whole method. It establishes rapport and relevancy to the dog without you begging for it or demanding it. In fact, silence you become relevant. Them. That's what yes. George Cockrell says. He says, silence is golden, duct tape is silver. <laughs> <laughs> I steal it. I'm not ashamed. But that's it. Check it out. I mean, that's, and, and, that, and there's an intuitive thing here, too. And just like what Robin was saying at the beginning, how she would take the dog and learn the dog so then she can learn how to teach the dog or teach the person to teach the dog. Um, you know, there's that connection. And that's what the bottom line is. It's just like what she said is building that rapport. And, um, you know, any way that we can do that, we owe it to these dogs to learn that method. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. You bet. Yeah. If you hold on for one second, I'm going to say goodbye to you on the end here. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And check out Robin's page. That's my dog. That's my dog. <laughs> Now you know the secret. Now you all know the secret. Yeah, now you all know share, the secret. Share the video so everybody knows the secret. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank uh, you. Any, any big things this weekend? It's not. Is it Memorial Day weekend? Not yet. 
Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Okay. Well, then have a regular weekend, everybody. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> yeah.